Hello everyone and welcome to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. We're glad you're tuned in. We want to give a shout out to our friends at Southern Oregon PBS, KTVL, KDRV, and the Dove Network. Thank you for hosting us on your station. In the Medford School District, we have one shared vision and that we believe that all are learning and learning is for all. And what better place to do that than right here on Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am the bug guy. I am John Jackson, Bugs R Us Educational Services. And uh, besides bugs, I actually teach 22 different topics. And a lot of you know me from uh, different programs at different Medford schools. But today we're going to talk about the Oregon Coast sea life in particular. We're going to learn about all the different types of life that live along the Oregon coast. We're going to talk about some plants, the mammals, fish, birds, and then we're going to break it down to the largest group of animals, not only at the Oregon coast, but certainly the largest group of animals on earth. They're called the invertebrate animals. Now, if you have ever been to the coast before, it doesn't matter if it's Oregon, Washington, California, as soon as you get out of your car in the parking lot, there are what are called four intertidal zones. And as we go through the program today, I'm going to be referring back to these four different intertidal zones. When you first get out of your vehicle in the parking lot, you are up in what is called the spray zone. And the type of life that lives up there uh, are the trees, the birds, grasses, things like that. The only time of day that uh, those life forms get water from the ocean is when the spray comes off the top of the waves. That's intertidal zone number one. The second intertidal zone, it's called the high tide zone. And that uh, the type of life that lives there, you're going to find birds, you're going to find maybe some things that have washed up onto the beach. Possibly the sea stars, you're going to find some kelp, maybe uh, some uh, jellyfish, things like that. And uh, only certain types of life can live in certain types of intertidal zones. So in the spray zone and the high tide zone, you're probably not going to find a lot of whales, and you're certainly not going to find a lot of fish. Just kind of makes sense. The third intertidal zone is called the mid-tide zone. And the type of life that lives there, it needs to be in the water usually 12 hours a day. 12 hours is the... Uh, the uh, interchange between high tide and low tide. So usually in the mid-tide zone, that's where you're going to find the tide pools. And a tide pool, it's like a little pond of water that's trapped in the rocks. And the type of life that you find in the mid-tide zone, you're going to find the hermit crabs, barnacles, mussels, sand dollars, things like that. And then the lowest uh, tidal zone, it's out in the deep water. That's called the low, uh, low tide zone. And the type of life that lives out there, it has to be in the water all the time. The big aquatic mammals, the fish, the aquatic plants, things like that. And throughout the program today, I'm going to be referring back to the four intertidal zones. It's kind of like a little game that we play throughout the program, okay? But you get out of your car in the parking lot, you're up there in the spray zone, you encounter the trees, the grasses, the birds. And again, usually the first type of life that you encounter at the ocean are the grasses, the trees, any type of plant life. But as you go down the beach from the parking lot down towards the, uh, the sand, you run across a whole different uh, group of plants. This is one of my favorite plants that you can find at the ocean. This is called bull kelp. And usually it's not brown and dry like that. Usually it's about 30 feet long. It's kind of green or black in color. And it's called bull kelp because you can swing it around your head like a bull whip, like Indiana Jones's bull whip. You can also uh, play jump rope with it. Mom and dad each get on one side. They twirl it in the middle. You play jump rope with it. And then uh, when you get tired of it, you jump on its head, make it explode. It's an all-purpose type of plant. But bull kelp is a fairly intelligent plant because when it's growing out in the open ocean, this is how it cements itself to the bottom of the ocean floor. That's the root ball of the bull kelp. It actually glues itself uh, directly to the ocean floor. But as it starts to grow, its head purposely fills up with nitrogen, and, uh, which is a fairly intelligent move. Have any of you ever tried to hold a beach ball underwater in a swimming pool. Doesn't work real well, right? If you are an aquatic plant and you live in the water and you fill your head with air, that means that your head is always going to be popping up to the top of the ocean, which is a very intelligent move because now you are closer to the sun. 
you get to pick up all that rich solar energy, makes you a very healthy plant. But then the big uh, storms, they brew up along the ocean, they tear this poor plant loose, they spit it out on the beach, you and I come along, jump on its head, right? Bull kelp, very intelligent plant. But along the Oregon beaches, there are roughly 75 different varieties of seaweed, kelp, and algae. And the really weird thing about a lot of those different types of plants, we use them as food also. Did you know you can eat a lot of those aquatic plants that grow along the uh, Oregon beaches? If you've ever had sushi before, you know that sushi is dead raw fish that's wrapped up inside of dead raw seaweed, right? So people eat seaweed on a daily basis too. But again, usually the first type of life that you encounter along the ocean are the plants and uh, usually grasses, trees, they live up here in the spray zone. But as you get down towards the water, then the aquatic plants, the seaweed, kelp, algae, they are going to live not only in the mid-tide zone, they get washed up on the beach, uh, I'm sorry, the high tide zone, also in the mid-tide zone in the tide pools, and because they're aquatic, you're always going to find them in the low tide zone also. Now, let's talk about some animal life. A lot of different types of animals that live along the Oregon coast. Uh, the first group that I want to discuss, they're called the fish, because that's exactly what they are. And there's a lot of different types of fish that live along the Oregon coast. This is a model of a salmon, obviously. And there's a lot of money that is made because of the salmon industry along the Oregon beaches. Not only commercial salmon fishing, but, you know, they get us tourists, too. You go over to the ocean, you take out a charter boat, you have to pay for the captain, the boat, the tackle, the fancy clothing, all that kind of thing. But there's a lot of uh, money that is generated because of the salmon in industry along the Oregon coast. But aside from the salmon, you know, there's a lot of other fish that live along the Oregon coast, too. This is one of my all-time favorites. Isn't that cute? Now, a lot of you automatically think that that is a uh, stingray. And you could be right. It's a, it's a model. It looks like a stingray. But usually you find the stingrays in the tropics. If you go to Florida, Africa, Australia, you run across the stingray. Stingray's got that venomous barb that comes out the tip of his tail. But the little guys that live off the Oregon coast, this is actually called a skate. It's like a roller skate. And it is a fish because it's cold-blooded like fish are. It does have gills underneath like fish do so they can breathe. And it, uh, it lays eggs like fish do too. But the really neat thing about the way that our friend uh, the skate here uh, reproduces, it actually lays one of these. This is a skate egg case. Hopefully you can see that up close there. It, uh, the nickname for this is called a mermaid's purse. It's got uh, little tabs on the corners, the female skate, she pumps one of these out. It's designed to land on the bottom of the ocean floor, and then when the babies are ready, they chew their way out of that egg case. And you can see how that one's been chewed out to uh, escape from the egg case. But that is a skate egg case, and again, the skate is another type of fish that you find along the Oregon coast. Another type of animal that is uh, very common along the Oregon coast a lot of different uh, birds. Uh, we've got uh, all kinds of fish. We've got a lot of uh, different types of birds, too. This is a very common type of uh, Oregon Coast bird. And uh, when I was little, it was called the seagull, but now it's had its name changed. Now it's just called the gull, plain and simple. When I was little, the only place you could ever find them was at the seashore. So it was called the seagull. But nowadays, they're over here at Walmart, Taco Bell, Jack in the Box. They have come inland because they are scavengers. So he's not called a seagull anymore, now he's just called a western gull. But it's a very uh, common type of bird. And a really interesting fact about any type of bird that lives along the Oregon coast, did you know that every type of bird is federally protected by law? Now what that means, if you are walking down the beach with mom and dad and you see a gull sitting in the sand, is it a good idea to pick up a stick or a rock and throw it at that bird? No, it's not. Number one, it's not a nice thing to do. But number two, if a park ranger witnesses you do that, your mom and dad are going to get to take home a ticket for $500. Federally protected species of birds. Don't mess with the birds at the Oregon coast. Did you also know that we have got islands off the Oregon coast? Surprise, right? Any outcropping of rock that is not physically attached to the mainland is considered an Oregon island. 
And sometimes you go to the beach and the tide is so far out, you can actually walk out to those Oregon Islands. Now, the Oregon Islands, those are federally registered nesting spots for any type of bird species. You find the gulls, you find pelicans, you find puffins, all different types of birds that live on those Oregon Islands. And again, if you go out to the Oregon Islands and you start harassing a mama bird or a nest or a bunch of eggs, if a park ranger sees you do it, you get to take home a ticket for $500. So leave the birds alone, right? But this is one of the birds that does live on the Oregon Islands. It's a nesting bird, very cute little guy. He's called the Puffin. Isn't he cute? Kind of reminds me of uh, Toucan Sam from the Fruit Loops uh, cereal box. He's got that multicolored beak right there. But the cutest thing about him is when he swims, he's got very, very short legs. So when he does swim in the water, he moves his booty back and forth really, really fast, just like that. Booty shaking bird. That's our friend the Puffin, uh, one of many different species of birds that you find along the Oregon beaches. Now, uh, we're going to backtrack for a second here. Going back to the intertidal zones, we talked about our friend the fish. Now, of the four intertidal zones, the spray zone, the high tide zone, the mid tide zone, and the low tide zone, obviously you're not going to find a lot of fish up in the trees, right? So the fish, they can only live in one of the four intertidal zones, and that's usually the low tide zone out in the open ocean. It is possible to find fish trapped in tide pools, but that's fairly rare too. But our friends, the birds over here, because they have the power to fly, you're going to find birds in all four of the intertidal zones. You're going to find them up in the trees in the spray zone. You're going to find them on the beach in the high tide zone. You're going to find them scavenging for uh, anything they can out of the tide pools right there in the mid tide zone. And you're also going to find them diving for fish out in the low tide zone. So birds, they occur in all four of the intertidal zones. But the next group of animals I want to talk about, this is one of my favorites because you and I are included in this group. Now we're discussing the mammals. And we are very lucky to live in uh, southern Oregon where we do. Anywhere along the Oregon coast, two times a year, we have the gray whales that migrate up and down the Oregon coast. Usually spring break, right around the end of March, that's a good time to go uh, whale watching. If you go to the ocean right around the holidays, anywhere from Thanksgiving to uh, New Year's, that's usually a good time to see them migrating up and down the coast too. Now for a gray whale, what you will usually see if you are whale watching, and if you're lucky enough to go during whale watching week, there are volunteers along the Oregon beaches, uh, any parking lot along the Oregon coast, and they will loan you their binoculars, their telescopes, so you can see out there at the horizon line where the whales usually are. Gray whales, you might see them breach with the dorsal fin sticking up above the water. You might see their tail as it's erupting out of the water as they're getting ready to dive. But normally what you will see is the whale exhaling. Now it's a mammal, same as you and I. It's got big, powerful lungs, and he will take a breath of air above the water, and then he'll dive. 15 minutes later, he will come back up and blow that breath of air out of his body through the two blowholes on top of his head. And normally what you see, it looks like a big puff of steam coming up into the air. That's usually what you see when you're whale watching. Uh, by the way, a typical gray whale is about three quarters the length of a normal school bus. School bus is about 42 feet long. Typical gray whale is about 35, 38 feet long. So that's a fairly good sized mammal right there. But our friend the gray whale has got some cousins. Now this is one, if you've ever been crabbing off the Oregon docks, if you have ever been uh, fishing anywhere off the Oregon beaches, this is a uh, harbor seal. Cute little guy, he's kind of like the raccoon of the ocean. He's a troublemaker too. Uh, as soon as you throw your bait or your crab pot into the water, he's the first guy that goes down and he tears up your crab pot. That's what he does for a living, right? But if you notice his pelt, beautiful uh, gray and black speckled pelt, it's built in camouflage. This is a type of animal, he lives in the water all of his life. And if you've ever been to the Oregon beaches on a uh, kind of uh, gray cloudy day, what color is the water? It's gray and black, exactly like his pelt. So he is the animal that's sitting in the water watching you, watching him. That's our friend the harbor seal. But we also have 
another member of the mammal family. And this one is fairly famous all over Oregon. If you've ever seen the movie Free Willy, you know all about the killer whale. The other name for the killer whale is the orca. And uh, this is a mammal you do want to uh, be wary of. There are a lot of them off the Oregon coast. Uh, number one, it is not a whale. So every part about this animal is very misleading. Its closest living relative is actually a porpoise or a dolphin. But the reason it's called a killer whale, it kills whales, pure and simple. It also likes to eat salmon. It will eat uh, all different types of uh, big mammals, sea lions, harbor seals. Uh, down on the South Pole, they actually attack penguins too. So killer whales, big, beautiful mammals, but it is one that you have to be wary of here in Oregon too. Now, the big aquatic mammals, these are a type of animal you're probably only going to find them on uh, one of the intertidal zones. You're not going to find them up there in the spray zone in the trees. You may find seals or sea lions. They come out of the water. They sun themselves on the beach. But normally you're going to find them out in the mid-tide or in the low-tide zone, certainly for the whales. If a whale comes out of the water, he doesn't have much of a chance. So usually the big aquatic mammals you're going to find in one or two of the intertidal zones. Makes perfect sense, right? Okay. Now, we are going to totally switch gears. We're going to get away from the standard animals that everybody thinks of when they think about the ocean. And we're going to talk about the largest group of animals on the planet. Uh, believe it or not, there are more animals on this planet that do not have a backbone than any other type of living creatures. Uh, what we're talking about, they're called invertebrate animals. And anybody at the ocean that makes their own shell is considered an invertebrate animal. You know this guy right here, right? Patrick Starr from SpongeBob. Now, this is a, when I was young, it was called a starfish, but it's not a fish, so he had his name changed also. Now it's called a sea star, which I think is a more fitting name anyway. But he wears his bones on the outside of his body, and we're going to come back and talk about this again in just a second. Uh, he looks exactly the same way dead that he did when he was alive. This is a dead animal. I'm holding him in my hand right here because he wears his bones on the outside of his body. It's called an exoskeleton. And believe it or not, the largest group of animals on earth, they don't live in the water, they live out of the water, and they also have an exoskeleton. It's called the bugs, right? Bugs have exoskeletons too. But along the Oregon beaches, anybody that makes their own shell is basically an invertebrate animal. And there's a lot of really neat things about our friend the sea star here. Number one, if somebody were to bite a leg off when it's alive, it's no big deal because he's got the power to regenerate an entire missing limb. And I know you can't do that. It's a pretty good trick. Another neat thing about him, uh, right back here on the back of his body, right there, if you can see it, I'm going to move up just a little bit. See that big hole right there? Isn't that interesting? We're going to learn anatomy now. This is the best part. That is both his mouth and his booty all at the same time. Isn't that amazing? But here's the best part. When a sea star finds something that he wants to eat, and we're going to use, uh, we're going to use the snail as an example. The sea star, he doesn't move very fast, obviously. It takes him forever to get where he's going. But once he's over the top of his prey, he squirts out his stomach. His stomach comes all the way out of the middle of his body. He wraps it around his prey, and he digests his prey from the outside of his body. Isn't that lovely? And then after he's done eating, he just simply sucks his stomach back in, and away he goes. So hopefully you're watching this at lunchtime or dinner time, right? Yeah, excellent. That's our friend the sea star. But sea star has got a very close cousin too. And this one I know you've seen on TV because his name is SpongeBob. That's him right there. This is an actual sea sponge. And the weird thing about this, it used to be a living animal. Uh, you can wash your car with it. You can dip it in paint. You can paint your living room walls with it. But you're painting and washing your car with the body of a dead animal. This is the exoskeleton of that dead sea sponge. And the neat thing about a sea sponge, when they're living underwater in the ocean, if you go underwater with a knife and cut him off flush from the ocean floor, he's got the power to regrow an entirely new body. But again, that is the dead body of a real sea sponge right there. Isn't that weird to think of? I think it is. How about this guy? Everybody knows him too. Isn't that cute? 
That's our friend the hermit crab. A lot of people have hermit crabs as pets nowadays. And uh, hermit crab, he's a type of animal he does not make his own shell. He actually has to rent his shell. As his body gets bigger, he moves out of the shell that he's in, and he will inhabit a much bigger, uh, bigger shell. If you've ever seen a, a hermit crab outside of his body, his armor plating is all along the front of the body, but on the back side, there's no uh, armor plating whatsoever. So he's always got to be tucked back inside that shell to keep himself safe. Uh, you go to any pet store nowadays, you can buy a hermit crab as a pet. And you also buy big, empty, painted shells. They have the Oregon ducks, the Oregon beavers painted on the shell. And you put those shells in your tank. And as the hermit crab gets bigger, he moves out and he inhabits the shell of his choice. So kind of a weird pet, but a lot of people have them too. How about this animal? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So this is called a sea urchin, sea urchin. And when they're alive, they usually have beautiful, very sharp, pokey, uh, purple spines sticking out of their body. And every one of those spines is attached to a muscle, and they can all move independent of everybody else. And there's a couple of good reasons not to pick up a sea urchin while it's alive. Number one, if you do try to pick it up, it's going to stab you in the hand. But if you do manage to get it out of the water, do not put it into the palm of your hand because the underside of that sea urchin, when it's alive, it's got a razor sharp, kind of looks like a bird's beak. And that's what they use to eat with. They uh, chew up seaweed, kelp, algae. And uh, if you put that beak in the palm of your hand, he's going to give you a little bit of a bite there too. But what a beautiful animal, right? Sea urchin. How about this one? Going back to our friend the snail here. How many of you know that Oregon is the only state in the Union that is weird enough to have a state snail? That's it right there. It's called the hairy whelk. And when this thing is alive, it looks like it's covered with a thick brown afro of hair. It's a very big snail. Uh, do people eat that snail? Yeah, people like to eat snails. You can capture them off the Oregon coast. Sometimes if you're crabbing off the Oregon coast with a crab trap, you bring the trap on board and the snails have climbed into the cra uh, crab trap. They're out there eating the bait that you put in for the crabs too. But that is the Oregon State mollusk, the Oregon State snail. It's called the hairy whelk. Good looking snail too. And that brings us to this one. Look at that. It's called a sand dollar. And a sand dollar is a very close cousin to our friend the sea star. And when a sand dollar is alive, it looks like it's covered with little tiny brown hairs. And every one of those hairs, they move independent of each other. And when a sand dollar is alive, it always parks itself upright in the sand, just like that. And it's a filter feeder. That means that it uses those little brown hairs to filter food out of the water and it pushes that food around to the back of his body right there in the middle of the back of the body, if you can see it, that's his mouth. So he crams all that food in there, that's how he eats. But then uh, big storms come up, they brush these things out of the sand, they throw them up on the beach, they can't live out of the water, sun comes out, cooks them, bleaches them white, and then you uh, have yourself a perfectly preserved sand dollar. Beautiful animals too. But one of the more common invertebrate animals that everybody knows, uh, even if you've never been to the ocean before, is this guy right here. This is our big Dungeness crab, very common. And again, this is one that everybody knows because he follows you home. If you go over here to Safeway or Albertsons or Fred Meyer back in the seafood department, it's the big orange crab that's sitting there on ice staring at you while you are shopping, right? But along the Oregon beaches, there are actually a lot of different types of crabs. I've got a small assortment of them right here. In this box, the one up there at the tippy top, that's called the red rock crab. Let's see if I can get it focused in there. There we go. Red rock crab. We also have the purple shore crab. We have kelp crabs, sand crabs, all different types of crab life. And, you know, you can eat all these different crabs, too. It all depends on how hungry you are because you have to spend a lot of time getting the meat out of a little tiny shell. But again, the most common crab that lives along the Oregon coast is the big orange Dungeness crab. Now, here's a question. 
and not many people realize this, but these crabs, they don't start life being five and seven inches uh, across. That's legal keeping size right here in the state of Oregon. So the quiz that I have for everybody that's watching, how old does that big orange Dungeness crab need to be before he gets big enough to be legally caught and sold right here in the state of Oregon? Okay, time's up. The actual answer is six years old. And this is how it works. Over here on the other table, I've got an assortment of crab shells. So what I've got on the table over here, this is the life cycle of the Dungeness crab. This little guy right up here, that is uh, the Dungeness crab when he's about three months old. When they first hatch out of an egg, they are microscopic and you almost can't see them. But because this is an animal that uh, grows from the outside, because of the exoskeleton, they don't grow like you and I do from the inside out, they grow from the outside. That means that they have to molt or shed their shells roughly 20 times in the first six years until they get big enough. That's five and three quarter inches across. And uh, if you have a dollar bill, you put that across there, dollar bill is exactly the same size as the legal keeping size for an Oregon crab. But that's how they grow. They get bigger, they need to shed their, their shells. Now, I also want to show you how the crabs do that, and it's totally gross, so I want everybody to pay very close attention. And this is how it works. When that uh, Dungeness crab, when he is ready to shed his shell, the front of the shell hinges forward. He slides out from underneath it. That old shell goes flowing through the water. His new body underneath, it is very compact, it is green and color, and if you were to touch it, it feels like a handful of boogers. Okay, picture that. Now, for about three days, he cannot move. If anything happens to that new shell before it's hardened, he dies. So while he is uh, going through his molting session, he just stays put on the bottom of the ocean, hoping and praying that nothing will attack him, right? But after three days, that new shell, it expands, it hardens and it turns orange, and then he has successfully hardened his shell. If any of you have ever heard of something called soft-shelled crab before, soft-shelled crab is just a crab that has been captured before his shell hardened. That's all that is, right? But average uh, Dungeness crab that you find in the grocery stores is about six years old. Amazing animals, too. So. I hope uh, some of you had some fun today. Eventually, we will get a chance to go back to the ocean. Uh, I have uh, sent the digital download of the intertidal chart to you, and uh, hopefully you get a chance to print that off. Take it with you to the beach. It outlines all the different types of life that live in the four intertidal zones, the spray zone, the high tide zone, the mid tide zone, and the low tide zone also. So I appreciate you tuning in today. Hope you had some fun. I had some fun too. And uh, we are here on the Medford Anywhere Learning TV network. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Medford Anywhere Learning TV. Medford School District is a place where all are learning and learning is for all.